Okay, it's getting late in the course and so things are getting philosophical. So the question that I want to answer is, what is the opposite of an array? And I know that's sort of a weird question because we can ask what the opposites of lots of, th what's the opposite of breakfast? Is it dinner? I have no idea. What I'm asking really is, we've used arrays for all sorts of things. Arrays are helpful for the things we've used them for. But there are lots of applications where arrays don't really help us. They make a real mess, even if we want to do relatively simple things. And we'll see, hopefully I can illustrate in some examples, that there are cases where we clearly want to perform some operation and an array can't help us do it. And in particular, I'm talking about operations on sequences of values, let's say sequences of numbers. So I guess the first question is, we've used arrays for more than a month now, what are they good for? And you might think, well, all sorts of interesting stuff, Bill, like strings. Well, well, yeah, but that's because we've been teaching arrays. Maybe it is that arrays are sort of useless and we've just taught all of the possible applications and now we've run out. We should really consider whether arrays are useful in general as opposed to they're a clever thing to teach in the second month of 111. So what are arrays good for? Well, the first thing is, of course, I can store a sequence of values in an array. And actually, when I talk about the opposite of an array, the opposite of an array is another way of storing a sequence of values. But once I've stored that sequence of values, what can I do with it once it's in the array? Okay, the first thing, if I have this array, and I want to add another value to the end of the sequence, as long as I have empty space at the end of my array, adding a new value is really easy. I just fill in one of those empty spaces. And we know already it's pretty common in C to use this pattern for arrays, to make an array that's way too big and leave a bit of empty space at the end, so you can easily tack on extra elements. We do that all the time we work with strings. Okay, so arrays are great for that. If I want to add something to the end, all I have to do is keep track of where is the end and make sure that there's extra space. But wait a minute. Eventually, if I make an array of any size, eventually the array will be full if I keep adding stuff to the end. So what about in this situation here? I made this array of size 9, and now I say, hey, could you add another element to the end? Add the element 100 to the end of this array. Well, you're stuck. Okay, but that's not something arrays are good for. We'll get to that in a minute. What else are arrays good for? Well, we can also easily ask for the element at a particular index. If I say, this is a sequence of nine things, numbered starting at zero, give me the thing at index number four. That's really easy. I just use a subscript. And if the array has 10 million things or a billion things in it, it's still really easy. I just go use a subscript. I just punch in a number and I can immediately go to that box and grab what's in there or modify it. So arrays are great for that. So to summarize, two things arrays are great for besides storing a bunch of numbers are adding something at the end, if there's space, and easily grabbing a specific element um, if you know its index. Okay, but what about, what are arrays bad for? So I've actually removed the indexing here because what I want to talk about is um, an operation that we might actually want to do quite often, but arrays can't help us with. So the first thing, notice that this array is full. It already has all nine elements. If I ask, could you insert the value 100 at the end of this array, your answer is no, you can't. It's impossible, the array is full. Once you've made an array, its size is permanent. If you fill it up, you're out of luck. I guess you could make a new array that's bigger and then copy all the elements in, but once this array is full, this array is done. Okay, so that's one thing arrays are bad for. Once they fill up, uh, you can't add any more elements. And that means you have to somehow know in advance how big you're going to want the array. We can't always assume that we'll have that. But another issue is, even if the array were empty, even if it had some empty space, so certainly if it has empty space, and I ask a question like, add the value 100 at this position. Well, that wouldn't be so tough. You just write it on in, right? It's easy to add something to the end. But what if I ask a question like, okay, the array does have empty space. Could you splice in the element 100 between the 11 and the 17? Hmm. Well, I guess you could. What you could do is you could move everything else over by one. And maybe you can see from the dead air here that this is a little bit time consuming. So I'm moving every element over and that shuffles the empty space to be exactly where I want to put the number 100. Okay, so I could do that. If I want to splice something into the middle of an array, I can always shuffle the other elements over. As long as there's some empty space somewhere in the array, I can move elements around to clear an empty space where I want to splice something in. But let's undo that. 
Okay, so then I ask a question like, could I splice in the number 100 at the very beginning? Well, still yes. I just have to shuffle everything in the array down. But let's think about this. This is an array of length 9, and it was pretty tedious to shuffle everything down. You could do it with a loop, with a, a shifting style loop. What if the array has 10 million things in it? And I want to add a new item at the very beginning, or I don't know, after the second element. I want to splice something in here, or splice something in here. What do I do? Well, if the array has length 10 million, I have to move every other element of the array over. That might be 10 million operations. And if I'm doing this very often, that is going to eat up a lot of time. And if the array has size 1 billion, it might become impossible to do that in a manageable amount of time. So one thing arrays are bad for is being able to splice in elements anywhere you want. And that's not even considering the, the overarching problem of what happens when the array is full. If the array has no empty space, I can't splice anything in anywhere with any amount of work because there just isn't any space to put anything. The array is full. But we've gotten this far in the course, working with arrays and discovering how useful they are. There are ways to work around some of these constraints. And, you know, frankly, some of those, those issues I just brought up, like splicing things in, we might notice are conspicuously absent among the exercises we've already done. So maybe arrays look a bit better than they actually are, just because we happen to be playing to their strengths. So what am I getting to here? Well, I want to talk about what the opposite of an array is, or at least what my opinion about the opposite of an array is. But I want to make one broad remark, which is that an array is an example of a data structure. It is a way of keeping data organized. Um, and in particular, it is a structure for representing a sequence of values, a sequence in order. 6 comes before 10, 111 comes before 17. The sequence is stored in some linear order, and the array gives us certain benefits if we store the sequence in the array. So benefits like, if I ask you for the value at a specific index, whether the array has size 10 or size 10 million, I can easily go and grab the element at that index. And I can add stuff at the end pretty easily. But with disadvantages like if the array gets full, I'm out of luck. And if I want to add something somewhere else in the array, I'm also sort of out of luck because I have to shuffle every element down. It's possible if there's empty space, but a bit tedious. So then the question is, what are my other options? So what I want, for example, is maybe I'm willing to negotiate. Maybe I say, I want a data structure to store a sequence of values in a linear order. So 6, then 10, then 111, then 17. But I'm willing to trade. For example, maybe I don't care so much about indices. I don't need to ask, give me the thing at index 4. What I really want to do is say, start at the beginning and give me each element in order. I don't care about jumping to a specific index. And in exchange for that, if I trade, if I say I'm giving up indexing, but in exchange, I want the ability to splice in elements really easily anywhere I want. Even if the array has size 10 million, or array, even if the sequence has size 10 million, even if it's, I don't know, full. I still want the ability to splice in new elements anywhere I want really quickly. So I want to make a trade. I want to negotiate the terms. And here's my idea. I think the reason it's really difficult to splice in new elements into an array is that the array is one big monolithic block. There, I can't actually jam something in between 111 and 17 because there isn't any space in there. There's the element 111, and then jammed right against it is the element 17. If I want to stick something between those two, I have to move stuff over. There just physically isn't any space. They're right next door. Okay, here's my idea. I think, you know, this would be a lot easier if there were a bit of padding between 6 and 10 and 111 and 17 so that I could jam new elements in. So I'm going to take the whole array, my sequence, and I'm going to explode it into a million little pieces. 6 and 10 and 111, and, whoops, not circled. Um, and I'm going to throw all those pieces in the ocean. And so here they are floating around randomly in the ocean, all of the little pieces of this array. And I've, I've done that already. Okay, so here they are floating in the ocean. And you'd say, well, that doesn't help. I thought you wanted to keep the sequence in order. 6, 10, 111, but this isn't in order. This is a bunch of stuff floating around in the ocean. What are we going to do? And I think what I could do if I threw all these little pieces in the ocean is I could chain them together. I could take a piece of rope and I could tie, uh, here's, here I am on shore, so start. I could say, well, how about this? I'm on shore, I'll tie a rope to the first element. 
floating around in the ocean. And then I'll have a rope connecting the first element to the second element. And then I'll take a rope and connect uh, the second element to the third one, the third one to the fourth one, the fourth one to the fifth one, and then fifth to sixth, and then ooh, this is going to go all the way around. All right, and then I've got this very last element here, and I will signal that this is the last element by having the rope connecting to it just sort of dangling around in the ocean. All right, so clearly what I have is not an array. I'm no longer working with an array. I am working with what I think is sort of the opposite of an array. Unlike an array, which is one big monolithic block of stuff, what I have floating around in the ocean here are a bunch of tiny things, each independent from the next one. And if I want to go through my sequence in order, I have to stand on shore and sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, reel in the rope. And so I'd say, okay, where do I go from my starting point? Well, let's see. I go to the six. And then I have this box floating in the ocean with the number six. And I ask, okay, what comes after this? And I follow the rope from that to the 10. And then from that to the 111 and 17. And maybe you can agree that if I have this system, this system set up, it is actually possible to go through the entire sequence in order and get what I want. Okay, but this is a weird gimmick. Why is it helpful? Why should I use this instead of an array? Suppose I ask the question, and actually I'm gonna, maybe I do want my array still there. Suppose I ask the question, can we splice in the number 100 between the 10 and the 111? Okay, something we can't do with this array because the array is full and because splicing stuff in requires shuffling around elements. Well, I think with my set of boxes floating around in the ocean, this might just be possible. First, I make a box with the number 100 in it. And then I figure out where in the chain would this go? Well, it would go somewhere between the 10 and the 111. So why don't I just, you know, disconnect these and then connect the 10 to the 100 and then connect the 100 to the 111. And maybe you can verify to yourself that if you start at the beginning and you walk along following the rope at each step, you will get the sequence that I wanted. I have successfully spliced an element in. Okay, but we could do that with arrays too. It just was difficult. Why is this so much better? Notice that when I splice that element in, the only things I touched were this, this, and the new thing. That's it. It doesn't matter if there were 10 billion other things after the, the element containing 111. I never even looked at them. The operation of splicing something in is now a, an incredibly local operation. All I care about is the little neighborhood surrounding where I'm splicing something in. And similarly, if I ask the question, could you put the element negative 5 at the very beginning of the sequence? Well, with an array, I would have to shuffle every single thing down. Even if there are 10 billion things, I have to shuffle all of them. What do I do with this construction? Okay, here I am on shore. I'm holding a rope that takes me to the first element. All I do is I make a box to contain the negative 5, and I just splice this rope. So I say, okay, well, now the negative 5 points to this, and my starting position points to the negative 5. And even if there were 10 billion things in my sequence, I never even have to look at any of them. I perform a very local operation uh, to splice in that element. And you might look at this and maybe you agree with me and say, wow, that does seem really easy, Bill, but why then do we even use arrays? I mean, seriously, if this is so much more convenient, if it saves us so much time and we never have to worry about it becoming full, then what's the point of an array? And remember that I traded. I traded in the ability to index quickly for the ability to splice. So if now I ask the question, could you, you know, beginning at your starting point, tell me uh, the element that occurs at index 6? And you think, well, actually, that's not easy because I don't, I don't really know how long this sequence is. I guess I just have to, to reel them in and count them off. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's this one. This is at element 6. But notice that in order to determine that, you actually had to go through all of the elements from the beginning up to element 6, unlike what you would do in an array. In this array, if I ask, what's at element 6? You just go right there. You get it instantly. And so that's the trade-off. And that's one of the reasons why the study of data structures is so deep is that it's not just about choosing one that gives you what you want because often in exchange for what you want you have to give up something you maybe don't want so much and so what we've seen here are two examples of relatively simple data structures up here I have an array and down here this construction throwing the elements out to C gives me what's called a linked list 
What is a linked list? Okay, so here I'll reconstruct it. A linked list consists of the following set of components. First, you have some starting point, and all that is is directions where to find the first thing. And you might hear the word directions and see an arrow drawn on the screen and think, I wonder if there's something we could do in C that would give us that feature. And then after uh, your, your starting point, the linked list consists of a series of nodes. We call each of these things a node. What is a node in this linked list? A node consists of two components. An element, in this case a number, like the number 6, and directions for where to find the next element. And then it points you to the next element, and then we get this next node here. It points us here, this points us here, and then this one goes down here. And then finally, that very last node, every node has to contain an element and directions to the next element. But what happens if there is no next element? Well, we have to have some way of signaling that the list is over, that we've reached its end. And so we'll draw it like this. We'll say this, there is no next element. And you might stare at that arrow and say, wait a minute, that reminds me a lot of a null pointer. Hmm, weird. We'll just have to keep that one in mind for later. And so a linked list is a series of nodes, each chained together. And the reason why this is so helpful is that modifying the structure of the list, adding a new element, only requires making a modification to the neighborhood where you're adding the element. So if I say something like add the number 100 between the, the 10 and the 111, all I have to do is make a new box, a new node with the value 100, have its uh, directions point to the 111 as the next thing, and then modify the 10 to point to the 100. It's really easy to splice in new elements with this representation. And so our very last topic in the course, what we're going to be closing out with, the thing that is going to require basically everything we have learned so far to some extent, is how to construct a linked list in C, how to realize this structure inside of C code.